Hi there, this is Al24 News live from Algiers coming up next in our news program. At least eight people killed and 17 others injured in deadly explosion that rocked Somali capital Mogadishu plus. In our news file, we will discuss the growth in the number of countries naming Lebanese Hezbollah group as a terrorist group. And finally, Germany announced record coronavirus fatalities and infections today Thursday as its total death toll passed the 100,000 with its most severe virus wave. Hello again and welcome. First in our top story, Somali police said that a suicide car bomb which exploded at street junction near the presidential palace in the Somali capital Mogadishu has killed at least eight people today Thursday. In a short statement, Al-Shabaab claimed it was responsible for the attack which targeted a convoy going into the palace. The High National Elections Commission in Libya announced the exclusion of Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, who is being pursued and convicted locally from the list of candidates for the presidential elections scheduled for next month. Zahra Farjani reports. Saif al-Islam Gaddafi did not succeed in overcoming the first obstacles to his candidacy for the upcoming Libyan presidency, as he was one of the 25 people whose files were cut by the Electoral Commission against what was stated in the responses of the public prosecutor, the head of the Criminal Investigation Agency and the head of the Passports and Nationality Authority, based on the Articles of Law No. 1 of 2021 regarding the election of the head of state. The Commission published on its official website the preliminary list of candidates, including the candidacy of the leader of the Libyan National Army, Khalifa Haftar, former Presidential Council member Ahmed Maitir, former Libyan Interior Minister Fathi Basha Agha, Speaker of the Libyan Parliament Aqila Saleh, Prime Minister of the Interim Government Abdel Hamid Debaiba, and Prime Minister of the former National Rescue in Tripoli, Khalifa al Ghwal. 73 primary candidates for the Libyan presidential elections is a large number that may give hope that the planned elections in about a month will be a real station for the beginning of Libya's salvation from the chaos that has been chasing it for an entire decade. Libya's UN envoy has told the Security Council it has a moral responsibility to correct past mistakes against the Libyan people and called for an end to foreign interference in the country's affairs. More in this report. Libya's UN envoy told the Security Council that it has a moral responsibility to correct past mistakes against the Libyan people and called for an end to foreign interference in the country's affairs. El Sunni said that Libya appreciates international initiatives in pursuit of a peaceful solution, but the process must be owned and led by Libyans. El Sunni said that Libya appreciates international initiatives in pursuit of a peaceful solution, but the process must be owned and led by Libyans who must lead and not be led. Ambassador Tahir El Sunni also told the Security Council meeting on Wednesday that the Libyan people will recover from this crisis and added we will become stronger. Council members voiced hopes that the elections will be held in a free and fair atmosphere and called on all parties to resolve disputes through legitimate means and refrain from disrupting the political process. The latter also called on Libya to do more to address its humanitarian challenges among increasing reports of inhumane treatment of migrants in detention centers in the country, despite welcoming a recent agreement on the disengagement of foreign fighters and mercenaries. El Sunni warned the invoice about belittling Libyan citizens, especially the youth, who are now more aware of the country's history in the past 10 years of conflict. He also said that Libyans have uncovered everything that happened and all the conspiracies against them and that Libyans are turning the page on a bitter chapter. The first visit ever of a Zionist defense minister to Rabat ended with a security agreement signed between Rabat and Zionist forces defense minister. The visit was not welcomed by the Moroccan population as the latter showed their objections to the visit in street protests. However, the Moroccan forces suppressed these protests who clashed with police forces.
And now to our news file. Let's review together the speech of Australian Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews, who announced in a statement the new classification designating Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. Let's have a listen. Written to my state and territory counterparts to consult with them on the proposed listings of the base and the entirety of Hezbollah. My aim is to move through the processes as quickly as I possibly can to ensure that these listings proceed in the quickest possible time. Now, Australians can absolutely be assured by this uh, intention to list and by the actions that we have taken, that we take Australian safety and security extremely seriously. We know that as we open our international borders, people will start to continue to gather and gather in greater numbers in crowds that's the sort of thing that terrorists look for. Now, I'm not here to scare people. I don't want to frighten people. I actually want Australians to be able to go about their lives, particularly their lives pre-COVID. And to talk more about this, Lebanese Jacqueline Bolos, political host at Radio Voice of All Lebanon, joins us live via Skype. First of all, Jacqueline, what is the fate of Lebanese community abroad living in Australia after the latter has included Hezbollah as a terrorist group? السلطات الأسترالية حرصت في خلال إصدارها Firstly, authorities made with political and military side when classifying Hezbollah as a terrorist group to ensure that the decision is only related with Australian interior security and that these authorities are not about to take measures against Lebanese community abroad, especially when they are from Shiite sector. And the decision has nothing to do with Sydney policy amendment against Lebanon and it's conscious about its relation with all Lebanese, including Shia. In addition to that, Lebanese resident in Australia, including Shia who are under security in terms of financial under their making and whom are transferring to, and amounts of money as their social media platforms are under precise surveillance with a greater possibility deploying who are suspicious to risk on Australia, deploying who are suspicious to risk on Australian citizens, as well as national security. This community abroad will be extremely cautious in every step it takes. That considers to be suspicious by Australian Security. Let's listen again uh, together to the statement of the Australian Foreign Affairs Karen Andrews that bears some fears of expected, let's say somehow, attacks on the Australian territories by members of uh, Hezbollah group. I have sufficient information in front of me to be concerned and to understand that the base meets the threshold for listing as a terrorist organisation. We are aware of their activities within Australia and overseas, and we will continue to uh, monitor them and their activities. We will look closely at their membership and we will take action once they are fully listed um, under the criminal code. Yes, we are concerned about activities of the base here in Australia. Jacqueline, what are your comments on this? Yet those who are not part of Hezbollah, even Shiite, are not concerned about this decision, according to what I believe. And I don't think they will be irritated or exposed to pursuit. In accordance with the Australian resolution, the Lebanese community abroad will be prohibited from joining Hezbollah with its political and military sectors, or even financing the later. Starting from this, every financial movement will be monitored under the circumstances which Lebanon is witnessing, and financial meltdown, and we know that the U.S. is helping, and it's always classifying major Shiites, businessmen as terrorists, and money laundering for Hezbollah. However, I want to emphasize on something. The Lebanese community abroad in Australia is estimated to be around 300,000, and the majority are Christians. However, the minority is considered to be Shia, so the majority will not be exposed to any procedures, merely those who are going to be involved in money Thank laundering you. and stocking ammonium nitrate, which is considered by Thank some European countries so to be much, used for terrorist Jacqueline. operations by his body. Thank you so much, Jacqueline Bolas, political host at Radio Voice of All Lebanon. You joined us live via Skype from Lebanon. And now to another story, the United States has warned that there is no military solution to Ethiopia's civil war and reiterated its support for diplomacy as the only option. Earlier, the Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed announced that he was heading to the battlefield to lead the fight against the Tigray Liberation Front. Hussein Berken reports. 
The United States has warned that there is no military solution to Ethiopia's civil war and reiterated its support for diplomacy as the only solution. A spokesman for the U.S. State Department said that Washington had seen reports that Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed is present at the front and report that high-ranking Ethiopian athletes, parliamentarians, and regional leaders said that they would join the prime minister in the front line. The U.S. urged all parties to refrain from provocative and hostile rhetorics, asking to exercise restraint, respect human rights, allow humanitarian access, and protect civilians. Earlier, the Ethiopian prime minister, Abiy Ahmed, announced that he was heading to the battlefield to lead the fight against the Tigray Liberation Front fighters, who have become a threat to the capital at Addis Ababa. The war broke out in northern Ethiopia 11 months ago between the federal forces and the forces of the Tigray Liberation Front, which controls the Tigray region in northern Ethiopia. Thousands of Ethiopians perished, and thousands more fled their homes to safer areas and to neighboring Sudan. The conflict extended to neighboring Amhara and Afar regions. At least 31 migrants died after the boat drowned in the English Channel. The tragedy is the deadliest since the channel became a preferred road for migrants to cross into Britain. Nabil Khazini has the latest. No milk, no water, no lip. A journey of hope turned into a nightmare. At least 31 migrants died after the dinghy drowned as they made a perilous crossing of the English Channel from the French side in Calais. Among the victims was a little girl who had the same hope of finding a better life in the UK. The disaster is the worst on record since the channel became a preferred route for smugglers. Officials in both sides have traded blames for the incident. Difficulties persuading some of our partners, uh, particularly the French, to, to, to do things in, in, in a way that we think is uh, the situation deserves. But what we want now is uh, to do more. The French interior minister said the fight against these criminals is an international duty. This horrible tragedy affects us all. The response must be international, coordinated and very severe in order to prevent more like it. We must fight against these criminals and against terrorists. President Emmanuel Macron said France would not allow the channel to become a symmetry and vowed to find out who was responsible for the tragedy. It is Europe's deepest values, humanism, respect for the dignity of each person, that are in Maureen, Macron said. Four people so far suspected of being directly linked to the incident have been arrested. While rescue teams who went in search for potential survivors later said 27 bodies were found. Two people survived and four others were missing and presumed drowned. According to the French authorities, more than 30,000 people attempted to leave for Britain since the start of the year and 7,000 have been rescued at sea. British authorities said more than 25,000 migrants have now arrived illegally so far this year, already triple the figure recorded in 2020. The world's COVID-19 situation is moving to a worse step as cases rate soured and all the world is concerned about the fourth wave of the pandemic, which is the largest and most severe for the people. And nobody knows what the next few months will reveal. Ayadi Osama. The journey with COVID-19 pandemic is never over. As many countries around the world saw a huge rise in case rates, and health organizations launch warnings that the fourth wave is approaching very rapidly and some countries' emergency care units already reached their capacity. World Health Organizations warned on Tuesday that further 700,000 people would die due to COVID-19 catastrophic rise in rates, taking the total to 2.2 million in Europe. The organization urged the people to have vaccines and boost charts to protect themselves and their families from the last violent wave of the pandemic. Confirmed cases globally surpassed 258.9, according to Johns Hopkins University, and the number of confirmed deaths is more than 5.16 million worldwide, as our word in data put it. Pfizer, which recently launched new anti-COVID pills as the last trend of medicines, filed a complaint on Tuesday to sue Chun Chiao Li, accusing her for breaching confidentiality agreement by downloading 12,000 files with no permission for her personal account. Li resigned from the company after 15 years of work. Calgary Zoo officials, on the other hand, stated that even the zoo animals which are vulnerable will be vaccinated as soon as the doses are available arguing that their vaccination will immunize them and prevent the spread of the pandemic through certain animals.
Protests in the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific Sea has escalated after discontent has long simmered over a perceived unequal distribution of resources and the central government's decision to switch allegiance from Beijing or to, to Beijing from Taipei. The protests are taking place for the second consecutive day despite a 36-hour lockdown being imposed. Nabil Khazini reports. Protest in the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific Sea has escalated after discontent has long simmered over a perceived unequal distribution of resources and the central government's decision to switch allegiance to Beijing from Taipei. The protests are taking place for the second consecutive day despite a 36-hour lockdown being imposed. Responding to a request from the Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands, Australia will deploy more than 100 police and military personnel to immediately assist with riot control. Further 50 personnel will reinforce security in the islands. Earlier this afternoon, I received a formal request from the Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands, Manasseh Sogavare, under our 2017 bilateral security agreement under Article 2, Clause 1, uh, for assistance for the provision of safety and security uh, of the Solomon Islands. Australian authorities declared that this step does not represent in any way an intention to intervene in the internal affairs of the Solomon Islands, adding that it is for the authorities in the Solomon Islands to resolve their local affairs. Demonstrations in Malaita broke out as Parliament resumed over the Prime Minister's lack of response to a citizen petition filled in August, which included demands for the government to respect the rights of self-determination of the Malaita people, to limit ties with China, and to resume development projects in the country's most populous island. Zionist entity authorities has given preliminary approval to a plan to expand Al-Quds municipal boundaries by building tens of thousands of extra illegal settlement houses in occupied east of Palestine, prompting Palestinian demands for U.S. intervention. On the other hand, 20 diplomats from the European Union arrived in Gaza Strip this morning to assess the humanitarian situation. Let's follow this report. The Oslo Accords of 1993 proposed a two-state solution with its al quds as the capital of Palestine, states including the West Bank and Gaza Strip. The entire city of al quds is claimed by the Zionist entity as its indivisible capital. In 2014, US-sponsored peace talks between the two groups came to a halt. Since then, Washington has recognized al quds the Zionist entity capital without formally endorsing the Zion's entity's claim to the entire city. European Union heads of mission and representatives visited Gaza, where they met Palestinian Authority officials and visited two majors crossing in Gaza, Karam Abu Salim and Al Arfra. Diplomats also visited the European Union-founded project and met with the representative of the civil society. Human rights defenders, political analysts, and representatives of the private sector and international organizations. Olaf Schulz will head a three-party coalition with broad plans for Germany's transition to a green economy under a deal to end 16 years of government led by Angela Merkel. Marwa Belaywar on what follow. Substituting Angela Merkel as chancellor after 16 years, Olaf Scholz of the Social Democrats in his opening speech urged Germans to get vaccinated, announcing a seven-point plan to tackle the health emergency and that his government would be considering the starter of a vaccine mandate. The three parties, known as the Traffic Light Coalition, hammered out the deal during two months of intense negotiations after the Social Democrats won a slim margin in the 26th September national election. The SPD, the Greens and FPD have agreed on a joint coalition agreement in the negotiations and thus on a new government alliance. Under Jolt's government, the main goal is combining the economics ministry with environmental protection. The three parties are going to be the first three-way alliance on a national level in German history, also the first to set tackling the climate emergency at the top of its agenda, which will be a priority in each of the ministries. Our goal is to lead the first alliance of red, yellow and green at the federal level. 
A coalition on equal terms as three partners bringing their strengths to bear for the good of our country. As part of the goal for Germany to become climate neutral by 2045, the parties have agreed to commit to phasing out coal and expanding renewable energies in order to cover 80% of all energy needs by 2030, on the other hand, and gas power generation by 2040. Social policies include increasing the minimum wage to 12 euro, which Schultz said would benefit 10 million Germans. The new government is expected to be sworn in during the week of 6 December. Before that, the coalition agreement has to be approved at the Social Democrats and the Federal Democrats Party conferences. The coalition negotiation involved 22 working groups and 300 negotiators. Oil prices and production are causing high tide between crude biggest producers and consumers. A struggle in output is a dominant scene for the two groups of producers in the world, OPEC Plus and its alliances and the U.S. shale firms. Ayati Osama. Global crude industry witnessed numerous changes in the last period as demand rates saw a huge hike in the post-pandemic awakening. Oil prices created a challenge for oil producing countries as well as consumers. USA went a step forward by increasing its reserve release, as proposed by OPEC+, Plus, which on its part refused the U.S. demand for more production and preferred maintaining slow pace of increasing output. The main reason behind which oil prices rose is the high demand of fuel, and some countries lived inflation and economic crises, including UK and Turkey. The International Energy Agency expects more oil production, which is 100 million barrels per day, to reach a surplus in the first quarter of the next year that can reach 1.1 million barrels per day. However, expectations depend on OPEC plus production. Contrastingly, International Energy Agency monthly report showed that OPEC plus is nowhere near the target as the last produces 700,000 barrels per day and less in the last two months. Consequently, to the investment and maintenance problems are the OPEC plus top producing countries in Africa, Nigeria and Angola, which will weigh on crude production in the next period. If crude production keeps the same pace next year, international markets will suffer from this tight situation for longer, and the world now is looking at the USA shale production, which rose non-OPEC output over the last 10 years. And we wrap up our news edition with some entertainment news in this report. South Korean superstars BTS were crowned Artists of the Year at the American Music Awards, becoming the first Asian artists and band to receive the grand prize. The group won three awards, brushing aside challenges from Taylor Swift, Drake and The Weeknd. Thank you, MAs. And we're truly honored to be on this stage with such amazing, tremendous artists right over here. We're so honored. Um, thanks for that. Um, with a few notable exceptions, AirPods are now in every ear. According to the Wall Street Journal, a new trend for wired rather than wireless headphones has come up. Bella Hadid, Zoe Kravitz and Lily Rose Depp have been spotted wearing wired headphones instead of AirPods like everyone else. Naima Johnson, the owner of N Beauty Incorporated, expects bangs, skunk hair and really, really long hair on the Soul Train Awards red carpet and celebrities to go big or go home at this year's event. It's the holiday season, we want to show up and make a statement, she says. Harder to tell the good from bad, villains from heroes these days. Kari Joji Fukunaga's 25th James Bond film, No Time to Die, topped Fast and Furious 9 at the Global Box Office this weekend. The latter has made more than $7 million at the North American Box Office, becoming the highest grossing Hollywood movie James. of the year. That's all for me, Nadia Kasmi, and the rest of the team. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.